Coffee Talks all over the U.S. He is currently the director at the Office of Postdoctoral Fellows at Harvard Medical School, and we will put the link to his LinkedIn page uh, in the comments uh, comment box for all of you so that you can uh, reach out to Jim, connect with him. He's always happy to be connected to more PhDs. We also have one of his articles in Nature um, that we have the link to that I'm, I'm showing on my screen right now. Uh, we'll put that link in the chat box for all of you in the comment section. That's a great article, and Jim has written for Nature, again, been invited to many, many talks, and it's just become a um, uh, one of the world's most foremost experts on helping PhDs make that next step in their career. And the reason we like having Jim on is because he's he works daily with postdocs and he understands the problems that you face as a PhD, especially, you know, we, we, like, we like to talk to Jim a lot about the technical problems, but also the, the mindset problems. And what I really like about Jim is he doesn't just go after the technical problems, he goes after the mindset problems. You know, the problems that we've talked about on, on previous shows of, you know, waiting until the last minute to take your job search seriously and so forth. And so on that note, Jim, the, the theme of this show is, really it's about prioritization. You know, we say doing doing less to get more out of your career, and I thought we could just jump in by talking about what do you think are the should be the biggest career priorities um, for a PhD, a postdoc, who is um, trying to ensure that they actually have options for their career, whether it's inside or outside of academia. So the the, the biggest career priorities that that's a difficult question, but in my mind, I. I think it should be a few things. It, it's hard to prioritize, you know, maybe 10, but if you can do maybe a top three, being, you know, a, an absolute expert in your field or technology or technique, being a visible person in that field, and then also cultivating and maintaining and activating a vibrant network of former schoolmates, former lab mates, and maybe even future employers. Mm -hmm. So those might be top three, and then I can talk about 30 other things that you should be doing as well. Yeah, so I mean, it's important because I think as PhDs, we wanna get into the weeds right away before we start, right? We wanna say, I wanna have everything figured out, make sure I'm doing everything right, and we don't take any action at all. And so one thing we've been talking a lot about is like, okay, it's a new year, it's a good time to think about like the <laughs> lowest hanging fruit. Like what, what are like the two things you could do right now um, to set yourself up uh, in the career. Like if you, you know, we were talking about the Pareto principle a little earlier, right? What 20% of your activities can bring you 80% of the results in your in your job search? I'm curious to hear your what, what your 20% would be. So my, my 20% might be what you can do right away would be making sure you're not doing this alone. Reach out for help and keep those lines of communication and those lines of help active and, and making sure that you don't become isolated and then maybe burnt out and you know turn into a negative mindset as you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Again, I will repeat, activate your network and continue to cultivate that network. And what I mean by activating in this sense is that you might know you're going on the market sooner or later, or you might even be on the market and just haven't done this yet but one of the quickest ways to, to find positions and hear about new things and reconnect is to just reach out and activate the people that you know. Mm -hmm. Tell them you're on the market. Don't necessarily ask for them for anything yet, but tell them you're on the market and to, you know if they hear or know of anything, do sort of more of a passive request. Mm -hmm. the, the third thing would be to be, um, uh, you know, probably like this phrase, cross-training. And, and making sure what you're doing is multi-purpose to kind of give yourself the most bang for your buck. If you're going to do something already, it's on your calendar, it's research related or career related, make sure you're doing five other things while you're there. Like, if, you know, uh, I've mentioned this before in our, our webinars and, and chats. If you're going already to your departmental seminar, weekly or monthly, make sure you're introducing yourself to the speaker. Make sure you follow up with the speaker. Make sure you introduce yourself to somebody or some, you know, a group of people that are new that you haven't sat next to. Mm. So making sure what you're doing is just kind of expand that to the rest 
of your um, rest of your daily life. If you're if you go to lunch, you know, in the cafeteria, make sure you introduce yourself. Maybe sit at someone else's table. Most of the time, they won't mind. The other thing is making sure that you're coming from a, a, a mindset and a perspective of positivity and moving forward, making sure that you're planning out your next strategic move. What's the next logical step for you rather than coming from a, 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 a place of fear or frustration? Mm. It's okay to feel that. It, it might even be you know, very close to the, the grieving process but making sure that your decision making isn't isn't coming from a place of fear but you move through that through reaching out for help through activating your network through cross training and making sure that you're moving in a positive forward um uh, creating positive and forward momentum those are no i love that so just to recap so ask was the first one so ask for help and i think that's right there uh, eliminates what most PhDs think to do first because we're just like well I'm just gonna read about it like I've spent my entire career being told to learn myself but one of the best ways to learn is just to ask people who know and to talk and, and not do it all yeah. in your head through reading um, I like that the alert that this is something that's come up a lot is actually alert people that you're looking for a job and I wanted to uh, dive a little bit deeper there just for just for a minute because there seems to be like this line you want to walk between not asking people to help you get a job right away and telling yeah. them that you're on the market very different right how would you draw that distinction so the the way i would do it is making sure your first outreach or your first outreach in six months or a year or two years isn't to send them your cv or resume and say hey could you shop this around for me yes. that would be maybe you know a week or a month or a couple weeks or months into this ongoing conversation would you mind having a look and giving me feedback mm-hmm. that's the ask rather than you could the, the situation i i find myself in sometimes is you know i have postdocs trainees fellow students come to me asking for help mm-hmm. but what they actually ask me that i feel that they're asking is can you find a job for me i'm a neuroscientist i do this i do this how can you help me it's mm. and that's not my job to find you a job my job is to help you through this process so you can then do it in two five and ten years when you're looking for another job because that's the rest of your career mm. if you do it right this time you, you may not be as you know find yourself in a black box the next few times you do it so yeah. the distinction is not not asking for a job but asking for guidance and appeal to their their wisdom having already been in that situation that's fantastic yeah and i think what we underestimate is that people want to give you they don't want to do the work for you nobody wants to go over and help you move your house right but (laughs) they would love to give you their advice on what they did to move their house right they would love to tell you all day long about their opinions their advice everything and i think this is the biggest uh one of the biggest priorities that a lot of us don't even think about just ask people their advice their opinion they appeal to their mentorship side which is easy to do when you're just been a student your whole life or you've been in academia your whole life because you're not seen as a threat right you're not seen as like someone looking for their their job because you're not in the job it's it, you have a much more i would say innocent um you come off as much more innocent and i, I like what you said too about kind of converging your efforts everything that you do you know you want to wear multiple hats with where you're so used to being very focused on academia and the next paper and this stuff, but a lot of the stuff you're doing right now, it's very transferable to a, a variety of career types. So you, you may not know that because you haven't thought about it in that way. So I think that was great advice too. Um, so what do, you, what do you spend most of your time doing? I'm very curious here, I mean, I because I used to not know, I, I obviously know more now, but I think it's very helpful to hear about, you know, you're, you're doing this day in and day out helping very driven, you know, uh, PhDs and postdocs in an area that's in the top four worldwide from the last report that I saw in terms of PhDs in a location, just in the specific Longwood area. Yeah. And there's Cambridge, everything. I mean, Boston overall by far is number one. So I'm just curious, you know, what have you, like in this past year, even six months, what kind of trends are you seeing? What are you spending a lot of your time explaining? What are the new buzzwords? <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I hope I'm fairly well connected with this community, but it, it's been almost the same uh, cycling since I've been here in 2011. Uh, being able to create and deliver career and professional development programs in the last year, as you asked, uh, I, uh, my office and myself have created and delivered 160 workshops Whoa. for as many as 5,000 5, postdocs in, in the Longwood area. Um, I advise and implement and uh, advocate for fair and reasonable policies uh, at HMS and Harvard. And probably the most interesting and boots on the ground uh, thing that I do, as you allude to, is I coach and advise trainees one-on-one. -on -one. And I hear their stories, I hear their fears, and what the, the trends that I have seen, if I see any, is that they're coming to my office a lot more informed. Mm -hmm. They're coming to my office a lot more positive than they have been before. Understanding that there have been changes and trends in, and even faculty development, that faculty now understand that all careers are worthwhile, not just academic careers. Mm -hmm. So that trickles down and helps, you know, trainees that I see and trainees that are in my workshops, that helps them sort of uh, take that risk, you know, the being risk averse and actually be able to have a, a conversation that is worthwhile with their faculty mentor, with other mentors, their network, as well as coming to my office and reaching out for help. The biggest problem that I, I encounter, and it's still fairly common, is, and I, I've talked to, to you about this before, is they don't know what they don't know. Yes. So they all, almost always start their job search backwards. Mm -hmm. They begin by applying to jobs rather than begin by activating a network, by pulling together their resources, by reading, by asking, um, and refining their application materials and asking for critique and then going out and being much more targeted and strategic. Mm -hmm. They usually start backwards and start by applying and worry about job offers rolling in, which isn't the process as you, yeah. as you come to know. So what, what is the process <laughs> in terms of just sequence? Because I think sequence is where a lot of people get stuck. Like you said, like it's, and I was, I was the same way. I thought, okay, I just started blanket applying to every job yep. and I evaluate my worth on how many responses I get which are none so then I go through this valley of desperation and rejection and feeling like I wasted I, in a sense like did I really waste my time getting a PhD is it not really valuable and you have to come out of that so what what's the sequence you would suggest given your expertise instead <laughs> so that's exactly what I used to do and you know uh, it's my job that I, I feel that it's my job to help people not commit the same mistakes I've committed. And knowing that you've done it, knowing that I've done it, hopefully takes away any stigma for those listening, that that's what you do when you don't know what to do. So the, the sequence is if you have the time, and if there's a timeline, I would say, would say you would give yourself at least a year when you know you're on the job market or going to be on the job market. You know, the longer the better, but probably a year. The first thing is do a, a fairly in-depth self-reflection. What do I like to do? What am I good at? What are my values? And begin to think, who do I know that shares these things? Who can I reach out to? What resources do I have institutionally in the lab, you know, in my at my alma mater, because you if you're a postdoc, you have at least two alma maters. You know, your undergrad, your graduate, you might even have a, a, a going to medical school, so that's three. So you have all of these resources that are just within your grasp. So you reach out and you say, what are the trends? What have you seen? Where have graduates from this school or, you know, people from this lab, where have they gone on? And actually, can I have their contact information and reach out with, to them? So you begin to refine your vision for the perfect job for you. It may not be the first one out of postdoc or grad school, but it, hopefully within you know two or three jumps, you are very close. So you get this idea, you visualize your ideal job, and you begin talking to people who you feel it, have jobs that are very close to that. Get their insights, 
and you begin crafting your application materials and you might be passively pulling in uh, job ads and opportunities. If there's something that you absolutely can't pass up, then you need to move on it very quickly. But give yourself time to digest what's out there and how to and learn how to read job advertisements and learn how to read between the lines and learn how to find out who you're going to be reporting to and then maybe reach out to them or somebody in that company or in that institution. So it, it's much more self-reflective and interpersonal than anybody gives it credit for. Mm. So that, that would be a general sequence. And then you go to a career counselor, a coach, Isaiah or myself and say, do you think my materials are strong enough for me to start applying now? Mm. And then you go through a series of revision, maybe peer review, expert critique, and then begin to apply. Yeah, very and, strategic, very focused and targeted. No, I really appreciate that. And, and I, for those of you listening, tons of value here. I mean, it kind of turns everything on its head a little bit from what you've likely just thought based on, you know, uh, skimming articles online. You know, you think it starts with a resume, that's going to be your ticket in. But it starts with, you know, doing your research, talking to people, the informational interviews, like Jim talked about even learning what the different career types are, um, getting a, you know, understanding the lay of the land. And there might be part of this where you need to get your professional profiles done to a certain level first, because as you start talking to people, they're gonna go to your LinkedIn profile, they might ask for your resume. Um, but you, you, know, you can get it to that 80% first, and then after you have these interviews and you do your research, like Jim said, you can take it the rest of the way based on the career tracks you wanna go into. Um, you know, I think, as Jim said, the biggest mistakes are just not prioritizing, not doing things in the right, the right sequence. Um, and I want to go back real quick, Jim, to what you said, because it's amazing. In one sense, it's taken forever, but in another sense, it's amazing how quickly things have turned around. Because I would say even five years ago, you know, when we were giving talks, maybe five people at the most out of a room of 50, all right? So maybe 10% of the people in the room, if they were asked, how many of you are sure you want to go into industry or outside of academia, right? That was the number, like five. And now it's almost flipped in the reverse. I mean, it depends on where you go, but I see that over and over again. I mean, it is at least half the room now. Uh, in many cases, much more. So it's amazing how quickly the data has gotten out there and that these trends, which I think is good because like you said, it's, it's going, it's trickling up, I guess, to the professorship level and they're starting yeah. to become okay with it and, and support it. What, what are your thoughts on, on, I guess, where the trend is going, especially for, you know, the future? And I don't want to get too, um, too techy or anything, but with a lot of the, you know, there's different ways that people are being trained at the undergrad level, and it's only, uh, only makes sense it's going to maybe come up to the, the graduate level with a lot more learning being done online, a lot of changes in academia. Any more broader trends that you see that it might help the PhDs to be aware of? So I, you know, you know, science and research and being having technical skills is always going to be very coveted and very important. The thing to do is to be as open-minded yet focused on your education and your training. What I see, you know, when, when you mentioned five years ago, maybe 5% or 10% would actually raise their hands. I know exactly what I'm doing, whether it's industry or academia. What you would see now likely would be half the room or maybe even you know 75% of the room raise their hand when you say, how many of you are going to, or thinking about industry, they'd raise their hand. And then you flip the question and say, how many of you are thinking of academia? Those same people would raise their hand because they're much more open-minded and understand maybe some of the nuances that it takes. You know, I, I am technically, you know, uh, I have technical expertise in this area. I know it's the next generation of you know, the technology moving forward, but I also still really want to, you know, pursue faculty and academia, and that pathway hasn't been closed to me yet. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is trying their best to keep as many pathways open as possible until they're ready to do that self-reflection and make that decision. This is the path I'm shooting for. Well, I also know that I've been cross-trained and have transferable skills for these other 10 careers that I could pursue. Mm -hmm. That's the trend I'm seeing. 
Yeah, and I don't think you can go wrong with being open-minded with your career. Um, you know, I think it's always that kind of balance. We talked about prioritizing. So you, in a sense, you want to narrow your focus on the highest leverage items. But at the same time, you want to stay open uh, to things that might come your way. Because a lot of it just has to do with opportunity, right? Meeting your preparation at the right time. And that means openness is going to help you. Uh, the, la the very last question I have, because I think it's a great question, is if your institute ran out of funding, if you're defending your thesis or your postdoc's over in two weeks, right? All you have is two weeks. What would you do to have a job lined up in two weeks? What would what would I do? What would you do? The first thing, <laughs> first thing I would do is outside of you know uh, telling my wife what the situation was, is making sure that I reach out and activate my first level network, my trusted friends and colleagues, and then hopefully they would be able to you know, trickle out to my secondary, tertiary, what have you. The first thing I would do is activate and look at and reach out to my network. The second thing would be to start canvassing um, certain positions or even targeting other institutions uh, and being strategic on, I know people there, or I know their program, or I know if, if I'm losing my job or I have to transition, that I, if I have to move, I know this geographic region is a hotbed or it's where I want to go in the future, so why not try it out now? So activate network, look at positions, and then target specific companies, institutions, or areas. And, and That's I, what I would do. And I love that, it's so simple. And, and for all of you listening, it's the same. You know, Activating your network is is huge, and, and you know it goes. It's, it's been said a thousand different ways. A, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? We always think I got to go out there and find somebody else who's going to give me a job. You know people right now, and Jim talked about it earlier. Go to your alumni networks. I'm still amazed about how many people they see us train on like LinkedIn alumni, and they don't spend any time there. You have people that are, I mean, thousands and thousands of people at most institute and universities that are all cataloged that many of them are working at the jobs you want to have and just the fact that you went to the same institution is an instant rapport builder, instant. Um, so I, I think, you know, and, and the people that you've obviously met and, and before, your current colleagues, other people that have gone on and, and transitioned, uh, digging in there is just super, just really, really valuable. And then, uh, you know, surveying where the opportunities are. This stuff shifts. All of you are in research. You can definitely research this information. I think it's very valuable. So, uh, Jim, I know you have to go. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, coming on and for rolling with the uh, the new platform that we had to use here. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation, and I look forward to uh, talking again. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So, again, you can find Jim on LinkedIn. We'll put the link in the chat box. It looks like Zoom is back up, of course. Uh, about halfway through this interview with Jim, uh, but go to Jim's LinkedIn profile. It's linkedin.com slash IN slash James Gould PhD and connect with James, check out his articles. We'll put his a uh, couple of his different articles in the chat box as well, as well as in the post show notes in the blog that will come out after this. Uh, really appreciative to have Jim on. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. And make sure you, uh, you uh, send a little message and if you want to link in with me otherwise I, i'm not sure where i'm where you're coming from and, and how i know you so give me a little note great yes follow the best practices the methodology we talked about yeah definitely send jim a note he will he will take note thank you jim Talk soon. thank you very much okay so we're going to move over to zoom here i'm going to stop this recording Call recording here. is off Find it soon. It joined me under recordings. Okay, great. Make sure we save that so that we can get that recording. We're going to jump on Zoom now and uh, hopefully continue with our regular scheduled program. One recording is being processed, so we will make sure that that interview with Jim, make sure that interview with Jim is uh, downloaded and edited and we'll put it into your dashboard. We're gonna try to get through a couple of other sections, hopefully to show me the data, hopefully the other interview that we have. I'm going to close this 
and we'll get on Zoom. I don't think we'll have time to stream Zoom live, so we'll probably just do it internally and then we'll splice together the interview with Jim and Zoom so that uh, it seems like everything worked fine unless you were here the whole time. But thank you all for staying on. We're gonna jump over to Zoom now. I'm gonna log in. I'll see what Mary's saying. If Kyle is available, we might have missed Kyle, but we can jump into the show me the data section, certainly. And it looks like we're already on here. So I just need a, who's joined as a attendee. For those of you joining us on YouTube, hello, hope you enjoyed that. We're gonna jump in here to a couple of other, our other sections today. We had a little bit of a late start because Zoom was down, but we managed to get a great interview with Jim, who is the postdoctoral, who is, let's see, I don't know if I can get into this, but maybe I need to do a, maybe I need to, I'm in. I'll raise my hand here. Lisa, Mary, if you can make me a co-host, we can get started. And... All right, I'm in. I'll raise my hand here. Lisa, Mary, if you can make me a co-host, we can get started. <laughs> me to start my video um, whoever the host is or make me co-host all right I just need you to make me co-host whoever is on here it won't let me start the video there we go we did it thank you Lisa Mary Jeanette piece of cake all right, we have 10 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. We'll probably go through 20 minutes. So we'll go through the, the as much of the show as we can here. What we're going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to start the live stream. Actually, we're recording this, so I think I'll just I'll start the live stream. We'll go through the show me the data, and then we'll switch over to the members uh, only section. And Mary Jeanette, we will just crop together those two interviews once I get the recording from Join Me, and we can post that to the public page. But for those of you that are joining us here, great to see you on. Thank you for helping us um, get through the long delay. We will uh, set up a couple of contingency plans, including Join Me, and we'll make sure those go out in emails moving forward just in case Zoom happens to be down again. Never been down like that before. Pretty amazing. But thanks for being on, Brent. Ahmet, Christine, Daria, thank you, Dilshan, Mara, Perez, good to see you on, Regina, Simen, Yu, Zia, great to see you on. Welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio show. I am your host, Isaiah Hankel with Cheeky Scientist. We have a great show lined up today, all about optimizing your job search uh, by doing less, not more. And what this means is, is prioritizing effectively. I wanna show you a page for a special webinar we have coming up tomorrow. So on January 10th, January 10th, we are doing a very special updated 2019 webinar on industry resumes. The full title is 12 Resume Secrets from Top Recruiters and Hiring Managers. This is for PhDs only. 
If you go to cheekyscientist.com slash PhD dash industry dash resume, you can join up for this webinar. Make sure you do it now though, because we, as of this morning, we had over 1300 people signed up already. That is a lot. Why do so many people sign up? Because they know that we have the most up-to-date information, data-backed information on what your resume needs to have in it to get hired into a job in 2019. So we'll put this link in the chat box again for those of you listening by audio, cheekyscientist.com slash PhD dash industry dash resume. I do also want to mention a brand new article we have that you can read for free on our blog. If you go to cheekyscientist.com slash blog, you can find all of our all of our articles. This article is titled Five Step Guide to Writing a Professional Resume in 2019. If you're listening by audio, it's cheekyscientist.com slash guide to writing a professional resume with a dash in between each one of those words after the slash. That'll take you directly to the article. And there's one point in particular I want to focus on. For those of you that haven't read this yet, point four is about leveraging the fact that people read in an F pattern. So studies show there's lots of eye tracking studies on resumes. Yes, people are very interested in this because Hiring managers, recruiters spend very little time on resumes, five to seven seconds total, which means they must be skimming resumes. This is why the format of your resume matters. This is what we're gonna cover in tomorrow's special webinar, which is at 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, again on January 10th, 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You do have to sign up to attend. But this F pattern helps you understand why formatting is important and how to set up the format of your resume. So essentially what it means is that when somebody starts skimming your resume, they read the first line across the top, right? So the, the top one third of your resume is called the visual center. Within this visual center, the two bars that go across from left to right of the letter F is how their eyes track. The first one goes all the way across. That's the longer bar, the top bar of the F. And then they, then they skim down a little bit further and then they go from left to right, but not quite as far. Both of these F bars happen in that visual center in, if you're doing your resume correctly, what's called the, the professional summary. Okay, that's why that first bullet point is crucial. Your first bullet point of your professional summary needs to be as specific as possible with the exact words that the company is using for a key transferable skill, a key technical skill, and a quantified result. What they're looking for the most has to be in that first bullet point because that's likely the only one they're going to read all the way through. Okay, then the other two bullet points will be skimmed in that second bar of the F, and then they're just gonna skim down the left-hand side of your resume. They're not gonna re even really read anything in your work experience section. You might as well just assume that. They might dig in that they're very interested, but in that first pass, they're just gonna skim down the, the left side final bar of the F that goes vertically, they're just gonna skim down. That means that everything next to every bullet point on the leftmost side of your page is what they're going to see. And what that means is, is that if you're putting in academic job titles, you're doing yourself a disservice. You don't need to put in an academic job title as the bolded word at the top of every work experience. Instead, we advocate using a rel relevancy resume where you say project management experience, right? And then underneath it, you can say experience gained as a graduate research uh, assistant at the University of XYZ. Okay, make sure that you're bolding and uh, formatting your resume correctly for the relevant information that they care about. They don't care about your academic job titles, your job duties, they just care about results and the key transferable and technical skills that you've gained. And we're gonna talk all about this tom on tomorrow's resume webinar. I do wanna mention this article from Nature Biotechnology. It's, the title is The Impact of Postdoctoral Training on Early Careers in Biomedicine. We're gonna talk about this article specifically. In short, I'll tell you what it shows. It shows that postdoc experience does not help you in your career, it actually hurts you. And before we go any more into this, I'm gonna bring Jeanette on for our show me the data section. So we'll see if we can bring Jeanette on here with us. Hello Jeanette, how are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you, no hiccups today at all. So that's good. <laughs> um, we're, we're ready to jump into the show me the data section. Great to have you on. So we've been talking a lot about this Pareto principle. We talked about this with Jim, the 80-20 principle where 20% of your efforts can get you 80% of your, your results. So I want to start here with this first article that you have, the impact of postdoctoral training on early careers in biomedicine. Why do we care so much about this? Let's start with that. 
why do we care about whether or not a postdoc helps? Is it something we hear about a lot or not really? <laughs> uh, well, it's really important to talk about because in academia, when you're a PhD student, the general vibe you get is that the next thing you should do is a postdoc, right? This is how your career is going to progress. This is what is going to get you what you want. Right. Right. And this article and just talking about this idea in general is really important in realizing that that actually isn't true. Mm. Right. That you're being told something that's wrong. Exactly. And so let's jump into this first figure. And for those of you listening by audio, um, the figure is showing on the y axis number of people, x axis, year of PhD awarded, all the way from 1980 to 2010. Um, and then on the, the far uh, right axis, I guess it should be a, the, the z axis, um, although it's not 3D, is percentage. And what we're looking at is a purple line, a red line, and a blue line. Purple line shows PhD starting, uh, starting a postdoc in terms of percentage. Blue line shows number of people awarded a PhD. And the red line shows number of PhDs in, a po in, in postdocs. And this yeah. is, a na again, a Nature Biotechnology article. So what we see is the red line, the blue line going up, which makes sense. The number of PhDs in postdocs has increased dramatically. Number of people awarded a PhD has increased dramatically. If you know, if you know anything Cheeky Scientist talks about, you've probably heard that trend before. But this purple yeah, line. Yeah, like, the numbers, right? So yeah. in 1980, it's like about 3,000 people were awarded a PhD, and it says in 2010, it's 7,000. And the percentage, though, is what's amazing. So it went from like 5% to 80? Well, so this percentage, I am, if I'm reading the figure yes. correctly, only corresponds to the purple line. Ah, okay, got it. So the percentage yeah. is the purple line. And yeah. so then we go from 3,000 to 7,000 in terms of numbers of PhDs rewarded. Yeah. And then, I mean, 2,500 to, what is it, about 5,000 5, for number yeah. of PhDs and postdocs. And this is just in, in this sample that they're looking at, correct? Correct. Because obviously yeah. there is at least 10, 20 fold that. I mean, yeah, these people were in biomedicine. Yes. So they've got a pretty specific niche that they've decided to focus on. Yeah. Right, so just in the US, for those of you wondering, there's at least in terms of those who have been uh, documented through surveys, 70, 80, 90,000 postdocs just in the US. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we're looking at this sample. Now we scroll down. This is possibly my currently my favorite figure that exists today that has to do with PhDs in the job because it's very important. I can't tell you how many times I've had people just, you know, really dig their heels in and it creates emotional response, which is understanding um, when the, you know, when we talk about a postdoc not helping your career like in that, doing more of a postdoc is the best way to say it so the caveat here i always like to say is look if you've done if you've done a postdoc there's nothing wrong with you you can we can help you leverage that experience to uh, further your career like you can you can we can help you talk about it if you focus on the right things it can be used as an asset but the earlier that you get out of your postdoc the better that's really the key here and so we're looking at a, uh, a figure here with four charts. Uh, y axis is salary, X axis is years from a PhD, and the four char charts are just different samples. So the first one's the full sample. Uh, the second one is uh, academic non-TT research. Third one is industry, and fourth one is government nonprofit. And we see a red line for those who did not do a postdoc and a blue line for those who did a postdoc. It's so simple. You can't hide from this. So what is, what is the first uh, chart show the full sample, Jeanette. Yeah, so the first chart, and we're comparing this red and this blue line, with the red being not doing a postdoc and the blue being that you've done a postdoc. And they're showing the way that a salary changes over the time that you've spent after your, like the time after your PhD. And the graph is so clear yeah. that not doing a postdoc, you make more money, bottom line. Like, dramatically and it's significant like those p-values in this paper to go with these this data that for the, for 13 years you make more money without doing a postdoc and in the paper they liken it to missing out on um three years like three years of salary yeah. <laughs> you know like is what you end up missing out on by doing a postdoc yeah, so, and here's the key takeaway, and it's, it's actually, if you go to, if you take away the margin of error, all the way to 15 years, you still do not catch up to someone who did not do a postdoc in your salary. 
So doing a postdoc hurts your salary, hurts your career trajectory, the end. Now, and the longer you wait, the more it's gonna hurt because you're just getting that later start on the huge gap that occurs in the beginning. So the gap between the two is much more in that first year, okay, with the no postdoc to a postdoc. Over time, about 20 years, which is in some cases an entire career, uh, you might catch up, but the data doesn't even show it catching up. That's what's amazing. And it's if you look at the different sample size, it's especially true in industry, right? So in the third figure, there's no catching up. Um, there, you catch up a little bit sooner in government nonprofits. So an argument that we hear a lot as well, that's just for industry. What about government nonprofit? What is it, Gina? It's still 10 years, 11 years before yeah. you catch up? Yeah, I think, I think it was nine. Yeah, nine or 10 years. With still the significant difference. The statistical significant, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, even in academic non-TT, so that's just um, like a, you're in academia, but not a professorship, correct? This is what's crazy to me. That yeah. figure right there was yeah. really, it struck me like, even in an academic institution where they're telling you that your postdoc is super valuable and this is what you're supposed to do, they're paying people without a postdoc more money. It's insane. I mean, that, and that's why when we talk about things like the postdoctoral system being broken, even abusive, and people are like, well, no, it, it is. I mean, if you look at the, the numbers don't lie, and that's why this article is, is incredible. I mean, it really is. And like, like Jeanette said, the data is very solid, p-values by nature. You can't argue. And, and it's funny because at first I was like, the academic non-TT, I'm not really concerned with that figure. And, and like Jeanette said, that's actually the most important one. In academia, you're, you're still behind by eight, nine years in terms of statistics before you'll even catch up to somebody who didn't do a postdoc. The only reason for staying in a postdoc is because you don't want to take on the hard work of an actual job search. And the only reason, that's on your end. And the only reason for staying in a postdoc in terms of the universities or keeping the system around is because it's inexpensive labor. That's it. And and, and that's the conclusion here. So how does this relate to the 80-20 principle? Jeanette, Jeanette and I were talking about this earlier. What what's the, what's the link here? Yeah, I think the link is that by doing a PhD, you've done the most important 20% of the work that you need to do in academia. Yes. Right? You don't need to go on and do six, 10 more years of work in academia, that 80%, yes. you already have reached your peak. There's no yes. need to keep going. So that's the 80-20 principle, right? Focus on that 20% that matters the most. Exactly, exactly. And and just to clarify, I, I like this figure. This is from an article titled The 80-20 Principle, The Secret of Achieving More with Less. For those of you that haven't heard of this principle, we have some very basic shapes to show you. So can you walk us through, we're looking at a triangle, and a circle and a rectangle. And it's the first with the triangle, it's causes versus consequences, the circle's effort versus results, and the third is inputs versus outputs. So just in general, what is this showing, Jeanette? Yeah, it's just showing that with those causes, efforts, and inputs, it's 20% of what you do in those categories that get you 80% of your results. Yeah. And I think, I know like as a PhD, as someone who like really values each of the items that I'm doing, right, all of the work I'm doing is important. Right, so this can be difficult to internalize and realize that no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's really only a small percentage, 20% of what you're doing mm -hmm. that is getting you most of your results. And this is, this is throughout your life and your career, and this is why prioritization is so important. Prioritization, sequence. As PhDs, this is something that we are not good at. I was not good at it because, actually, I remember when I first got to uh, graduate school, and I was a little bit intimidated. Um, we had uh, we had courses. My first two years, we actually had courses we had to go to, and I was intimidated. They gave we had like textbooks, everything, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna read everything in the textbook, even though this is not something I did like in undergrad, anything like you focus on what they talk about in the lectures, etc. I was like, I'm gonna read everything, the little sidebars, all this stuff. Of course, I couldn't even stay keep up with the lectures and everything I was doing in the lab to do this, and it was a complete waste of time. And I bombed my first couple of tests, and it just goes to show that. We're doing this already, but you need to do it more, right? If you go, if you have a course, you don't try to read the entire textbook. At least you know all of it won't be tested on. So instead, you try to focus on the highest priority stuff, which is indicated by what the lecturer says. Same thing in your job search. There's those highest priority items you want to spend most of your time on, because it's going to have most of the output, most of the results, most of the consequences. Um, let's turn to a chart. We can move on from basic shapes and colors now. Uh, so this is this is an article titled "Understanding the Pareto Principle: The 80-20 Rule." 
Um, a quote from the article from Nature, well, the, the first article with the chart that we're looking at here is from Better Explained, um, which is a site that focuses on the 80-20 rule. And then, then we have some call-outs here from Nature and from Skill Crush. And the call-outs say 20% of the stock of goods held in a practice accounted for 80% of the value, 20% of the items of service accounted for 80% of the fees paid. So before we look at the chart here, which is just showing the 80-20 rule versus a, a linear line, what is that first call out in reference to? What was what was the Nature article talking about? Yeah, so it was actually about a dentist office. It was That's what it was focused on. And um, these are other just like examples of where this is playing out that you might not really realize. And to show you that it's a universal, like you just mentioned earlier, it's like a universal sort of mm. concept that was someone thought of you know, a long time ago. <laughs> and um, yes. so this one is saying right, that 20% of the, the goods that were in the dentist's office was 80% of the value, yes. right? And then 20% of the things that they did, like the the services they provided, got them 80% of their money. Yeah. And and, and this goes on. Uh, the next call out says 80% of customer complaints or business errors come from 20% of the problematic business practices. 20% of the tech skills lead to 80% of tech jobs. It's amazing. So if you look at this chart, for those of you listening by audio, we have a red linear line, which is used as a reference point, and then we have the green line that accounts for the 80-20 rule, where by on the on the the y-axis you have results, the x-axis you have effort. So by point two of effort, so this is just on a, uh, where one is the max on all of it, so you could say 20%. At about 20%, right? So 0.2 of the effort, you're already up to 0.8 of the results. So almost at the top. And a lot of you have experienced this. It's just called the learning curve. The problem is, is that we spend five years of our life at least getting a PhD. I mean, the average is for all PhDs is like six to ten. But if you're in STEM, let's say five. You spend five years, and you you know at the end of that time that you're not anywhere near an expert, even on a field that's as narrow as possible, right? Because you're up in like the 98% and to get to the 99% is gonna take you another 10 years, and you'll never get to the 100%, you could get to like 99.5 of what's known out there, et cetera. You have to put aside that mindset, right, when you're executing a job search or starting something new. You have to remember that there's the other part of the learning curve. Most PhDs try to jump right up to the top here before they take any action. You wanna to get to 90% before you act on your, your job search or to, to change your career path. You don't need to do that. You can get to 80% very, very quickly. So what, what's your key takeaway here, just as it relates, before the final figure, as it relates to a job search, Jeanette? Yeah, I think if you relate the Pareto principle to your job search, right, it's really important to think about what are the most important 20% of the things you're doing in your job search. Mm -hmm. um, we talk often about how networking is so important, and sometimes we waste too much time trying to write this, like, brilliant, perfect resume right but that's a waste of time <laughs> really yeah. you need to focus on those most important 20 percent mm -hmm. and i really like that last one where i was saying that 20 percent of the skills accounted for 80 percent of the jobs yes. so to realize that even if you don't have all of the job the skills listed maybe yes. you have 20 percent, and that's enough yes. right you have those important 20 percent of the skills that they need which are usually the transferable skills yes and then you can just go for it Right? right, and just realize your that you have what it takes, and focus on the twenty percent that matters. Right, and if you're like, what twenty percent do I have? We talk about it all the time: the speed of learning, right, the ability to teach yourself, uh, you know, your your internal drive, strategic planning. All of these things are actually listed in numerous studies and surveys as being the most crucial things. You have that, so there's nothing really holding you back. So stop focusing on like the 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 very small percentage that's outside of that 20% that's not gonna give you any of those major 80% of results. Um, so Jeanette, where did this 80-20 principle come from? What's the, uh, what's the yeah, history? Yeah, so um, I can't remember his first name. I totally wrote it down, but I can't remember. But Pareto, that is his last name. Yes. <laughs> he came up with it um, a really long time ago and he found it based on land use and he found that like, uh, 80% of the land was like owned by 20% of the people and used for these certain things. And he didn't really say it that way. It was extrapolated like a century after he put it on paper. 
people uh, like a hundred years later turned it into this what we know as the Fred Open School, yeah. but it's really grounded in this really basic understanding of how resources are used, mm. and that's why it's so universally applied because everything is a resource, and so resources are always applied and fall into these this uh yeah, and it's simple. everything, and it's it's every yeah. resource, and everything is a resource. So. This final figure is from an article on pdfs.semanticscholar.org, uh, just titled The Pareto Principle as it applies to GDP. And what you see is in the, the countries with the, the richest 20% of the countries have 91.62% of, of the GDP, like total, like the worldwide GDP, right? And then like all the rest are less than 9%. Pretty astounding, but we hear about, like this is a macroeconomic topic that we hear about in the news all the time. For those of you that are in Scientist MBA, you, you, you've learned this and, and you understand what this means. But resourcing, right, it's, it's a verb also, resourcing is something that's crucial in business and, and, and your job search and in every aspect of your life. So perfect, Jeanette, any final thoughts on the GDP? Was this surprising to you? Um, I mean, no, not really. I mean, because I live in the world and sort of know what's happening around me, but it is, it's books. interesting to break it down and to, to think about the extrapolation. And yeah. I think that especially, right, we like these sort of intellectual discussions. And so take that thought into your brain and see where it is in your own life and in your job search and where can you make the most of this principle? Yeah. Where can you focus your efforts? Agreed. And for those of you listening by audio, so the last figure we're just looking at on the the y-axis of percentile all the way to 100%. Uh, x-axis, we have the richest 20%, second 20%, third 20%, fourth, and then poorest. And again, 91.62% of the GDP is in the top 20%. And if you look, if they draw a curve with this cumulative percentage uh, average here, uh, a red line curve, and it almost exactly mimics, right, the, the Pareto principle curve up here in green which is amazing. So no matter what the resources are, uh, the Pareto principle applies. So when it comes to your resources, your efforts, day in and day out in your job search, focus on those uh, most impactful, high leverage items like Jim talked about. And, and there's a reason, just in the, the Cheeky Scientist methodology, that we have the module structured the way that they're structured. You get your professional profiles done to a certain level, like that 20% level that's gonna give you 80% of the results, so that when you're out networking, which is really one of those items that's going to give you most of the results, setting up informational interviews, et cetera. If they ask you for those professional profiles, you have them done to a professional enough level to keep moving forward. All right? So all of the little things that you're likely worried about are, are not maybe not irrelevant, but they matter so little that you're actually holding yourself back because you're putting so many resources toward it. So focus on the things that, that matter the most, that have the highest impact, and, and use the 80-20 principle as your guide. So. Thank you, Jeanette. Please thank Jeanette for coming on with us. Thank you. Great to see you. Okay, we're going to move forward here, and uh, we're going to jump in to our interview with James Gould. I'm doing that as a segue because we're going to we're going to cut this video to edit in the James Gould interview here. Um, for those of you that are on with us still, thank you for staying on. We are going to jump to the members only section here. So it's, I'm going to do a closing here, and then we'll stay on and do a LinkedIn review, and we'll cover the, the transitions together. So thank you all. For those of you watching us on uh, any of our public social media pages or platforms, uh, wherever you're watching us, remember that you can join us for our free resume webinar tomorrow. Uh, this is January 10th, Thursday, January 10th at 1 p.m. Uh, and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I will mention the link one more time here. Uh, it is our resume webinar, special resume webinar. We will focus on getting your resume ready for 2019. The full title is 12 Resume Secrets from Top Recruiters and Hiring Managers for PhDs Only. So we have over 1,300 people signed up already as of this morning. Make sure you're going to this web page that I'm showing you here. And if you're listening by audio, it's cheekyscientist.com slash phd-industry-resume. Sign up today. So thank you all for watching the public portion of the radio show. We will see you next Wednesday with another live radio show starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And again, make sure you sign up and show up for the resume webinar tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Okay. 
So I'm going to stop the recording here. Oh no, I got to keep the recording going, right? Because I have the dashboard. Mary, are you there? How are you? I'm great. How are you? We did it. We pulled this together. We did it. So for those of you watching here, thanks for staying on. All of you here in Zoom, thank you. So we're just going to go through two final things here. We're going to go through the transition stories. Uh, we will announce a swag winner, and then we'll do a quick uh, LinkedIn review for everyone here. Um, so while I have Marianne, I'm going to show the transition list. So many transitions that we haven't discussed yet. I want to say, say thank you to Mary for collating all of these transitions together. We also have a Cheeky of the Week and a Moderator of the Month. So congratulations, first of all, to Ajish Sharian, uh, who transitioned into a senior scientist role. Uh, congratulations to Superna, who transitioned into an associate in project management role. Congratulations to Mari, who's in the Medical Science Liaison Alliance program that we offer. She transitioned into a consultant project manager role. Congratulations to Christupas, transitioned into a optical design engineer role. Congratulations to Ryan, a magnetism specialist. I would like to see what that job does. Uh, it's in an R&D position, so congratulations. Uh, Bibhudatta, who's also in our Medical Science Liaison Alliance program, transitioned into a clinical tri trial coordinator role. Well done. I don't think he had clinical uh, experience either. Um, common misconception, you don't need clinical experience to get into those clinical careers. Congratulations to Anna, who transitioned into a senior innovation consultant role. Congratulations to Victory, who transitioned into an MSL role. Again, not a surprise. Victory is in the Medical Science Liaison Alliance as well. Congratulations to Eugene, who transitioned into a researcher role. Navnita, who transitioned into a scientist role. Asif, who is now an associate engineer. Antin, who is now a senior scientist. And yes, we're still going. Uh, Jialing, or Jialing, I think it is, uh, transitioned into an engineer role. Congratulations. Shilpa transitioned into an environmental scientist role. Orly is now a senior project manager. Is this the third page? Kirthana transitioned into a scientific manager role. Well done. Uh, Haino uh, transitioned into an application scientist role. He's part of the scientist MBA program. Well done, Haino. Uh, Petro transitioned into a senior research scientist role. Shadra transitioned into a scientist role. Uh, so Shadra is in the scientist MBA program as well. Brent transitioned into a medical device analyst role. Stefania is now a senior scientist which makes sense because uh, Stefania is in our R&D Society program. Temi transitioned into an MSL2 role. Well done. Sharath transitioned into a senior scientist role. And Beth transitioned into a regulatory affairs management role. Well done. Wow. So many transitions. We knew, we knew how it was going to be up at the end of the year and at the beginning of this year. This is good news for you. Make sure you congratulate everybody on that list. Tell them well done in their transition stories. Uh, reach out to them on LinkedIn. Be polite, don't ask for something right away, but just tell them congratulations. Um, they've earned it and you will be next. Our Cheeky of the Week, who is it, Mary? Richard Liang. Richard, congratulations. Thank you for giving so much to the group. We really appreciate it. Please do us a favor and tell Richard congratulations. This post is marked as an announcement in the private group. We really appreciate those of you who go above and beyond add value in the group. Thanks for setting such a great example. And a very special thanks, we only do this once a, mo once a month, to our moderator of the month, Sonali Pandey. Congratulations, Sonali. Uh, if you've seen this, this is quite an honor. Please tell her thank you. She has given so much value back to the group after transitioning and really detailed value. And she, her professionalism has been it's just a very special thing. This is something, again, that we hand out very rarely to those who just transition and then give back. So thank you for giving back, Sonali. We really appreciate it. Please connect with Sonali on LinkedIn and tell her congratulations from the group, too. Okay. Last but not least, besides our swag announcement, special thanks to Karen for uh, allowing us to go through her LinkedIn profile here. Um, Karen has done a great job on her LinkedIn profile. She's at that 80%. We're just going to try to bump it up a little bit to 90%. Uh, the first thing that I noticed here, Mary, was really, really professional headshot. Um, 
I like that she has at least targeted her headline to start and she's gotten the, the basics down here in terms of her summary, etc. In terms of this visual center here, just everything we can see when we first open LinkedIn, what are some of the extra things she might be able to do to, to increase her visibility? Um, well, she has the default um, LinkedIn banner, so it could be a good idea to have a banner that is sort of more personalized or represents your pre professional brand, where you're headed. Um, you could add some text to it. You could, um, it's something you really, um, it's an opportunity to work on and it can make a big difference. Mm. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, it takes very little work. Do some resizing, open up PowerPoint, which most of us know how to use, add a little bit, bit, bit of text that just makes a list of, you know, maybe what some of your key transferable technical skills are, who you know, that little bit of effort will really make you stand out. Um, scientist, agronomy, entomology, plant pathology, this is great, but I would try to focus more on the technical skills, the transferable skills that you're seeing on job postings. Scientist, I, I really like that you have that because you want to use the generic words that are likely being searched by hiring managers. You know, they're not, they're probably not going to search for uh, agronomist, right, entomologist, scientist is, is much more likely. You, you clarified a bit there, but I think you, you're using academic words. Anything with ology is spawned from academia, which is fine, but you really want to focus on, again, technical transferable skills that you're seeing in the top two, three, four different job titles you want. And you actually want the job titles themselves, right? Scientists might be one, but maybe another, and locations. What else do you think? Yep, I was thinking location, absolutely. Do you want to stay in Nebraska or do you want, are you open to relocate or what, what's your plan? It would be nice to know that. Um, I'd also like to see, so I took a peek at uh, Karen at your profile and I can see that you do some uh, mindfulness work and, and, and it's always nice to see a hobby. Um, so a little bit more so we can learn about you as a person. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's something great that I think a lot of people can identify with. And if meditation might seem a little bit too um, specific, something like mindfulness would work. And it's kind of a trending thing. It's not too personal. It would be perfect to add onto your uh, profile. I really and, like that idea. and it's a great skill that that would be an, a value add to you professionally, right? So it kind of goes both ways. Um, if you're mindful at work, you're probably performing better too. Yes. And I don't know what this link is to. Um, it looks like it's broken though. It might just be broken on my end, but you, won't, you might want to check that. And this usually happens when LinkedIn changes something in their algorithm. You just have to re-add the link again. Um, but having a broken link, it's just one of those things that unfortunately can come across as unprofessional or like it's not, it's not updated, right? Uh, so make sure you change that. I do like that you talk right at the beginning that you're results oriented. However, where are the results? So if you're gonna say you're results oriented, that's great. But remember that professional summary, it's good to talk about. I think you can tell a narrative here, hopefully a future-facing narrative, but you definitely want to have your results. Can can you refresh your screen? Because I'm seeing a different profile. She <laughs> She's update? updated it. <laughs> Are you updating this right now, Karen? From an hour ago? That's hilarious. Well, let's see. You got rid of the link. That's good. Um, no, no, that's totally fine. So I think... Yeah, she, she might be updating it right now, which is awesome. Uh, still have result, results oriented, which I like, but I would just make sure um, that you're actually putting in the results. And you know, I would make sure you have somebody else read it just for grammar purposes. And again, we're, we're just pointing this out to help um, enjoy team works efforts. Not quite correct grammar, um, right? Enjoys working with the team. You might want to check out some of the data we talked about recently where adding uh, Team, you know, uh, teamwork at all to a resume or a profile reduces your chances of getting an interview. It's, it, there's always these, there's buzzwords that kind of ebb and flow that will help you um, get get an interview. And there's buzzwords that become overused, such as enthusiastic teamwork, that can actually hurt you. And teamwork has become one of those words. So actually, for anyone listening, I recommend taking away teamwork, taking away enthusiastic. Right, focusing really again on the specific technical transferable skills that are put on the resume, not these generic items. Now, there's a difference, right? If it says on, if not on the resume, but on the job posting, if it says good time management skills, that's not too generic. That's specific to what they want, right? 
just don't say generic stuff that is not relevant to the positions that you want. And for LinkedIn, of course, it's got to appeal to all different types of jobs, but make sure you're getting that language from the job postings themselves from informational interviews. So we have a comment in the chat box um, from Brent saying, what about turning off the people, uh, people also viewed list on the right side? Um, because that does advertise your competition, but then the conversation continues, but it could be a good way to add value to your network. So. Yeah, so at, from your point of view, you can you can find your network and you can look at uh, people who have viewed other profiles and do intel. But if you're looking for a job, and this was Donna Sardua's advice, and I think it's great, you do want to turn this off because think about it from a hiring manager's or a recruiter's point of view. They're going to go to your profile and maybe they're like, oh, this person is looks pretty much the same in terms of what's in the information and I might want to talk to them instead. I mean... But yeah. Sorry, um, the, the follow-up question was, does it tur turning it off decrease um, how you come up in, in algorithms, LinkedIn's advertising your profile? Great question. We haven't seen that. Yeah. Now, of course, I, the algorithm is not public, unfortunately, um, but we, work, we do work pretty close with Donna, and, and she would be one of the first to know. So we have not seen that so far. Good question. All right, we got to wrap up here, but I do want to say great job writing an article. This is so easy, so easy. And if you have, you probably have literature, articles, whatever out there, take a paper you published, summarize it, post it as an article with a picture to the journal. Instant credibility. Instantly something right here in the top and look at, it just looks credible. I mean, this is great and share this. I would share this, you know, share this in the, um, on, on your LinkedIn thread, share it with other people. Uh, you know, you can, you, all of us create our little communities in the association with other associates that we talk with, that have informational interviews with. Ask if uh, somebody can share it or like it, and, and you can do the same for them. Um, but you can definitely, uh, and one thing I would say too is share it multiple times. Share it on different platforms. Uh, a lot of times we write an article and that's it, but you can take this article and you can reshare it. And you can re, you can um, reshare it to your, for yourself. And you can add little hashtags too. And just as Donna said before in the previous uh, radio show too, go with the hashtags that it, it recommends, that LinkedIn recommends for you. Make it easy, don't go for things. While you're, while you're in that section of the profile, um, we also learned that recruiters will look at your activity on LinkedIn. So we, can, we could click on select, uh, see all activity, what kind of posts you like. That also gives some you know, clues about who you are as a person. If somebody is actually trying, wanting to connect to you, then they might look at that to get to know about you. So I think it's, it's important to say that to be intentional in your, with your activity on LinkedIn yeah. and be active. And it looks like you've been very intentional. I mean, the first few things that I see, and let's face it, they're gonna scroll through it. The first few, it shows, okay, you know, network, more plant and biology yeah. stuff, agriculture, I think well done there. Yes. And that's about all we have time for. I do, I always like to scroll to the bottom to look at volunteer experience. Really important to have volunteer experience, especially any experience that might be outside of STEM. Um, I liked, I like the first two because they have titles that are more business oriented, right? Like a lot of foundations and stuff, they'll have, you have to have a president, treasurer, secretary, et cetera. Um, but it, it can be appealing to, to those people who are used to that kind of language. And it's not just, you know, student organizations. Student organizations are fine. But at the very least, make sure you're filling out a volunteer, your volunteer section. It should be robust. There's likely many things that you've done, even if it was something you did for a day. Right? Like in one of my universities, we all had a day where we helped with Habitat for Humanity. This is something you can talk about. Um, just think back and, and make a catalog list and, and, and do it because we see more and more hiring managers go into that volunteer experience section. Yep, especially when you're considering company culture. If the company culture, if they really favor like group activities, giving back, they want to know that you're going to participate with them mm. in that and you'd be a good fit, so. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, Mary, who is our swag winner? They should get, uh, they should be our double swag winner because they s stuck around through all of these technical difficulties, so thank you. They were, they were with us in Facebook and here, yes. Amit Garl. Amit, thank you. We will send you one of our journals. Really appreciate it. Great to see all of you on. Thank you for sticking with us wherever you stuck with us. Great to see you on. Did we stop YouTube? Maybe not. <laughs> Looks like we just stopped though. Great to see all of you on. Thank you very much. And we will see you uh, on next week's radio show. We'll have a backup. So no matter what, we will be up and running 
at the top of the hour. Thanks, everyone. All right. That was easy. A special thanks to uh, Mary and Lisa. We get a lot of troubleshooting uh, to help us be able to get on Jim and to be able to get to the major points of our radio show. Uh, we will clean up the recording and we will merge the two recordings together. In fact, I think I have the, the join me recording here. Let's see if it's done. Maybe. Oh, it's close. So we should be able to download that pretty soon and we'll get that up. All right, so we all know what time it is. What time is it? What do we do at the end here? Muzak, Muzak, yeah. Music is, I think that's a, actually a trademark thing for elevators. Somebody came up with that. That's actually a business, Muzak. Type of music you hear in elevators in like different stores. That's a certain type of music that's set to like rise and fall at certain times. How do I know that? I think it was like uh, one of the comprehension questions on like the GRE or something. <laughs> Somebody remember that? Sophia, can you turn off the YouTube? I think it might have froze, but if you're watching us, thank you on YouTube for watching. We will see you on the next radio show. Okay, who wants to hear it? Let's see what size. 